Hey everyone, welcome back to my show. Hope you are doing great. Today, I'm going to talk about a country where most likely the phone you are using was manufactured, the TV that you have was manufactured, or the car that you are using was manufactured. And if you are still wondering, this country has the world's most watched YouTube video, the Gangnam Style. Open Gangnam Style. Gangnam Style. Yes, you got it right. It's South Korea. You would be surprised if I tell you that in 1960, just 60 years in the past, South Korea was one of the poorest countries in the world. It was so poor that a country like Zimbabwe was more developed than South Korea. South Korea started as an agricultural economy in 1960 and in 2019, that is in just one generation, South Korea became the 10th largest economy in the world. In those 60 years, South Korea has experienced one of the largest and greatest economic transformations in the world with an average growth rate of 9% per year. But for the last 10 years, its GDP rate has fallen well below 3.5% and the government debt is increasing like never before. So how did South Korea become such a developed and highly advanced country in such a small time period? Why is its growth slowing down every year? Is South Korea's economic model sustainable in the future? Let's find out in this video. This rapid growth of South Korea is known as the miracle on the Han River. Han River is the river which flows through Seoul, the capital of South Korea. To understand this miracle, we need to look into South Korea's history. Before World War II, Japan was ruling Korea. But after World War II, when Japan surrendered, Korea got divided into two parts. The south part, known as South Korea, was controlled by the US, and the north part, known as North Korea, was controlled by the Soviet Union. After this, there occurred Korean War in 1950, when North Korea invaded South Korea with the help of China and today's Russia. When the war ended in 1953, South Korea was on the losing side as all the infrastructure and industries were in North Korea, and the South Korea was all agricultural and underdeveloped. But South Korea did not bow down and decided to fight back and grow. Today, South Korea's economy ranks fourth in Asia and is the twelfth largest economy in the world. South Korea brought in several major reforms, which led it to become a highly developed country. Let's look at them one by one. First, even though South Korea was autocratic and governed by its military in 1960, its military leadership was all about the development and growth of the nation. In 1960, under General Park Chung-hee, South Korea adopted protectionist economic policy. Under the protectionist economic policy, South Korea restricted imports from the outside world and started developing internal industries. South Korea completely stopped the import of all the goods except raw material, which was necessary for country's industrialization and development. While they stopped the import, they pushed the export to bring in more money into the country and use it for further development. As per recent data, in 2018, South Korea was the fifth largest exporter in the world. During this period, South Korea even stopped the financial aids it was receiving from the US to develop itself and become self-reliant. At that time, corruption in South Korea was very high, and to get rid of the corruption, Park Chung-hee took one of the bravest decisions and arrested all the corrupt businessmen, which included the richest man in South Korea as well. And instead of putting them in jail, he worked with them closely to push country's industrialization. But still, the question remains: Where did the companies get money from for the development? So, before stopping the financial aid from the US, South Korea already received 3.1 billion dollar in aid from the US, which was a very huge amount for that time. Also, when Park Chung-hee worked with these businessmen, these entrepreneurs built some of the very big family-owned conglomerates known as Kaiballs. Some of these Kaiballs, which we all know, are Samsung, LG, and Hyundai. In order to fund these companies, Park Chung-hee nationalized the financial institutes and poured money into these companies. The government also gave various incentives to these companies like tax breaks and special import rates. The government not only gave them money but they closely monitored these companies for their performance and they evaluated their performance to make sure that the companies are efficiently using their support. Another thing was during this time period, South Korea was also experiencing social transformation. As because of the war, lots of people lost their properties and wealth. And as you know, when one loses everything, he or she is ready to work day and night to achieve it back. Similarly, this destruction of properties resulted in level, flexible society that was open to new change and optimistic about the future. Another most important thing responsible for South Korea's growth is its rapid educational development. South Korea highly emphasized the importance of education to develop a nation and encourage its people to educate. By 1960, 96% of all children of primary school age were attending school. Additionally, state and private groups carried out highly successful adult literacy programs. As a result, South Korea in 1961 had the best educated workforce of any country with a comparable income level. By 1990, South Korea's higher education enrollment was almost equal to that of developed countries. 
Today, South Korea, with almost 100% literacy, is one of the top performing OECD countries in reading literacy, mathematics, and sciences. Even after being a developed country, South Korea spends more than 5% of the GDP on education. This highly skilled workforce helps the country to develop technologically advanced products to compete with the world. But even with all this development, why do experts say that South Korea's economic model is not sustainable? Let's find out. Many experts suggest that South Korea's economic model is not good for its economy and people in the long run. As we just saw, the Kaiballs or conglomerates like Samsung, LG and Hyundai in South Korea are so big that they behave like monopolies. You'd be surprised to know that Samsung has its own theme parks, hospitals, universities. Samsung even manufactures tanks and guns and many other things which we cannot imagine. The song Gangnam Style is all about the Gangnam district which is one of the richest and expensive areas in the world where most of the Kaiballs are located. As these Kaiballs form 80% of the country's GDP, the government cannot afford to lose them. As we discussed in our previous video that the monopolies are killing the economies, South Korea is the perfect example of it. These Kaiballs are so big that no one in South Korea dares to start a business. Kaiballs are literally killing the entrepreneur culture. Because of this, South Korea's GDP rate dropped down to just 2% in 2019. The other very serious problem Kaiballs have created is suicides. Because of Kaiballs' monopolistic behavior, people of South Korea has only one option to earn their living – by working for one of the Kaiballs. And to do that, students need to study very hard to get a well-paying job in one of these Kaiballs. Their ambitions are only to work for these Kaiballs and go up the career ladder. As a result, education is regarded as a high priority for South Korean families as success in education is necessary for improving one's socio-economic position in South Korean society. Academic success is often a source of pride for families and within South Korean society at large. Children from a very young age are pressurized to do well academically. This situation results in children ending their lives. South Korea has one of the highest suicide rates in the world and is ranked 10th globally. South Korea is also facing several other major problems such as limited land, limited natural resources, population explosion and many others. Even though these problems are deep, the South Korean government is hopeful and working to solve them and bring prosperity and happiness in the country. And from all of this, we can say that development is good and very important for a country to go ahead but not at the cost of people's lives and dreams. So that's it for today guys, I hope you enjoyed this episode, all the best. Do let me know in the comment section what you think about this video. If you like this episode, please leave a like and definitely share it with your friends and family. And do subscribe to our channel. Thank you guys. Bye bye. Take care.